some soared at the US Open and some crashed and burned, but where are they headed next? I'm here to try and predict the future. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to the tennis vlog. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already done so. The US Open, the final Grand Slam of the season is over. There were two champions, Novak Djokovic and Naomi Osaka in the men's and women's singles, and there were a couple of shock exits as well. So today I'm going to take a look at our two champions and the two exits that I found were the most shocking or that I think other people would have found the most shocking. I'm going to take a brief look at the US Open fortunes of these four players and then look to the future and see what I think might happen to them over the next few weeks and even months. So starting with the women's champion Naomi Osaka, the 20 year old and number 20 seed who stampeded through most of her early matches to reach the final where she faced Serena Williams and won in straight sets 6-2, 6-4. A match famous for all the wrong reasons and I commented on it extensively and if you're watching this video you've probably already seen that one but if you haven't seen it now might be a good time to check it out. Before I go any further I will say a word about Osaka and the situation because many of you wanted me to. Naturally I thought the whole situation was incredibly unfair on Osaka and what I found incredibly sad myself was that Osaka didn't even seem able to address directly the fact that she'd won her first Grand Slam in social media posts the day after it had happened. Since then it seems she's been really able to settle down and enjoy her victory which is great. And I do think this situation will actually turn out in her favour in the future because already people have been pointing out how incredibly she handled herself in the situation, how humble she was, how sweet she is and how genuine she is and all of that. This has been highlighted by the situation. And more than anything, this story has been a massive headline and it's propelled Osaka into the limelight and people who maybe don't even know much about tennis now know who she is. Given that she's from Japan, she's the first Grand Slam champion ever, either man or woman from Japan. And and tennis is steadily growing in Asia thanks to Lee Na and Kei Nishikori. Osaka is going to be a massive name in years to come, I believe. Especially given her game and her raw talent for tennis. And I have to say here that this is not a star suddenly being born. Osaka has been on the rise for many years. I've been watching her since she was about 16, 17. And you could always see the massive serve, the big ground strokes, the raw potential. Over the years for Osaka, it's been a case of adjusting little technical aspects of her game, growing as a human being because you need muscle and that kind of thing. Getting the right team around her, which has been incredibly key, I believe, into striking Grand Slam gold this early. But perhaps most of all, confidence and belief has been a really key thing for Osaka in recent months and in her development throughout her career. At the US Open, Osaka's full ability was on display, very aggressive, very proactive in the way she was playing, but also very tactical. In the final against Serena, she really outplayed her opponent and she didn't out hit her, Serena was hitting a harder ball, but she went toe to toe with her and she was not relenting in the long rallies. I think particularly impressive was Osaka's movement, she's not a short player so movement doesn't come as easily, but back and forth she was definitely staying with it. However hard Serena hit the ball or however well she directed it, Osaka was getting to them all and returning them with depth. So Serena tended to get a bit rushy and try and have the finish shot or try and make a winner and it wasn't working for her enough because Osaka was so consistent. And even though she tightened up a bit at the beginning of the second set, the way she served out the match showed just how comfortable she was feeling. She was in her first major final against the greatest female tennis player of all time and she served it out with such poise and such belief in her ability and that was very impressive to see. That mental strength was probably wildly impressive to the majority of people but the thing is with Osaka, she likes playing on these big stages. This is actually where she seems to feel most comfortable. On the biggest stages, against the biggest players, in front of packed out stands, that's what she likes. But there are different forms of mentality. The mentality it takes to withstand pressure and beat the best players and win a Grand Slam is different to the mentality it takes to be consistent against the lower ranked players you should be beating and to turn up on a regular basis at smaller tournaments. And I think that's the mentality that Osaka still lacks. There is a reason that Osaka has only won two titles in her career, those being the US Open just gone and Indian Wells earlier this year, which is the next biggest tournament after the four Grand Slams. So for Osaka going forward, she has the technical game. Obviously, she's not going to always have her best day, so she's not going to suddenly beat every top 10 player she faces, but she's going to
going to do better at those Grand Slam occasions. For me, what she really needs to work on now is her consistency at the smaller tournaments, and this is why I think the next few weeks are probably going to be a bit of a struggle for Osaka. We're going into the Asian swing, and given that Osaka is Japanese and she likes the big stages, you might think this is a situation where she should thrive. However, she's just won her maiden Grand Slam title, and we've seen with a lot of players who've won their maiden title, it's very new to them, and suddenly they find it hard to deal with that and the extra pressure that it brings after they leave the Grand Slam stage. Then they're going back to WTA international events, Premier 5 events, events of different prestige to the slams. And Asaka actually went two wins to five losses during the Asian swing last season, and her two wins came at the same tournament, so wasn't a successful time for her last year. She's playing in Tokyo this week, I wouldn't be surprised to see her go out in the first couple of rounds, maybe even the first, but I think that how she performs in Tokyo will have a major forecast on how she performs for the rest of the season. If things don't work out for her early on, then there is a chance for her if she qualifies for the WTA finals to experience the big stages against the big players there again and come out with something special. But at the present moment, I think Asaka's going to be a big name in the sport. I think she's definitely going to win more Grand Slam titles, but I don't really see her doing anything significant again until next season. Moving on to Novak Djokovic, who is back to world number three after his run to the US Open title, beating Juan Martin Del Potro in the final. He didn't drop a set after the second round, which tells you something about how he performed. I picked Djokovic to win before the event, as I know many, many people did. His only real stiff competition for me at that moment was Rafael Nadal, because Federer was having a bit of an iffy time. Everything was in the right place for Djokovic. He'd got his form back after Wimbledon. He'd had a very strong period between Wimbledon and the US Open. Nadal was feeling the physical effects of a very successful season. Federer was having a bit of a wonder, which we will take a look at very shortly. And given that Djokovic was getting back to his former standards, he was a step up from the rest of the tour. So a 6-3, 7-6, 6-3 win over Juan Martin Del Potro in the final. I was mostly impressed with Djokovic's consistency incredibly consistent and that has been one of the big keys to his game and to his dominance throughout all these years. When he's believing, which is another key to his win because he's full of confidence and looking very comfortable now on the court. He can get to every ball. He can not just get to every ball, but he can send it back with great placement. And you just can't put the guy away. He springs back like an elastic band. He is so consistent and very solid all round. He's got an all-court game. I do think Del Pocho missed significant opportunities in that match, especially in the second set, but another great thing about Djokovic is his timing, his ability to be there in the biggest moments and he made sure that he was on the right end of those situations. He didn't hesitate to approach the net, he constructed the points well and he followed up his hard work, made good use of the slowness of the courts as well. The courts were slower this year than in previous years and that helps very much a player like Djokovic who doesn't go away, as we've said, who is up for those long rallies. Since Djokovic got his form back at Wimbledon, he's been looking incredibly strong. He's won four of his last three tournaments, and in the tournament before that, he held championship points. And now, for the back end of the season, when a lot of players are getting tired, he has a lot more energy because he wasn't playing so much or so well at the beginning of the year. And it's very much in his favour that he's got an impressive list of victims from his past few tournaments. It all aids his confidence and his mentality and his confidence are the groundwork for the brilliantly consistent game that we're seeing from him. Even better for Djokovic is the fact that he has zero points to defend for the rest of the season. He has a great all-court ability, but hard courts, indoor hard courts, definitely his thing. We've got events in Asia, we've got events in France, we've got the ATP finals. Djokovic has had success at all of these tournaments before, and some of his key rivals are looking a little bit iffy. So for me, I see Djokovic winning multiple titles before the year ends. I think he's definitely the favourite to win the ATP finals, and unless Nadal stages an absolute miracle and wins multiple titles and gets fully fit for the end of the season, I'm saying that Djokovic will be the year-end world number one. Moving on now to our shock exits and starting with world number one Simona Halep's shock loss to Kaya Kanepi in the first round. Do you remember that one? All the way back on the first day of the tournament. And I've already commented on it, so if you haven't seen that video, I'll link to it up there and you can go and check it out because I did in-depth talking on what happened during that match. Kanepi really attacked her serve and got on the front foot with the returns and Halep couldn't keep up with the power and the pace coming from her 
experienced opponents. I always find it quite hard to say what's going to happen with Halep, which is kind of strange because since she really broke out onto the scene at the end of 2013, I think she's been one of the most consistent female players on tour. And as her ranking reflects, this season she has had a more consistent year than any other woman. She reached the Australian Open final, then won the French Open. But it was when she won the French Open that things started going a bit up and down. A lot of people were calling her the favourite to win the US Open because she almost won back-to-back -back Premier titles coming into it. She didn't have a successful Wimbledon, lost in round three, and then that first round loss at the US Open. So I think for Halep at the moment we can compare it to Novak Djokovic having won the French Open in 2016 after chasing it for years and years and years, but not on that level. Halep has been chasing her first Grand Slam title for a number of years and she's come close on several occasions. She then wins the French Open and gets the monkey off her back kind of thing. And it's almost like after that, she doesn't really know how to handle herself. Basically, I don't think she's had time really to sit down and properly digest what she's achieved and work out what she wants to do now. Because tennis never stops. She won the French Open and boom, back onto the grass courts, prepare for Wimbledon. So as of the four players we're looking at in this video, I think it's hardest to say what will happen to Halep. A part of me would say she needs the off-season right now. She needs to sit down, take stock of where she's at and what she wants to work on and then move forward into a new season. But given that she lost early at the US Open, maybe that gave her the opportunity to do that. I think she was quite upset by that loss, but decided to take the positives and the learning curves from it. And maybe that is what she's needed to actually properly focus her again when it comes to these big tournaments. The WTA finals coming up could be a good target for her because she's reached the final there before back in 2014 and she has every ability to win that. The WTA is full to bursting with talent but not as full of consistency so Halep essentially has as much chance as anybody else ranked inside the top 50 going into these next few weeks. Her Asian swing last year was very up and down. She essentially lost in her first round of her first tournament because she got a first round bye then she went all the way to the final in her next one and then at the WTA finals it was loss loss win so I reckon it will be an up and down few weeks for Halep and she might just do something at the WTA finals at the end. And now very swiftly and very quickly on to Roger Federer who started the season in such dominant fashion but now doesn't look quite as convincing as he did in January. Federer's score lines were looking deceptively good I think ahead of his loss to John Millman in the fourth round which is a match that Federer should really have won. Millman is a great player, a real fighter, one of the nicest people you could meet in the sport but I think he acknowledged himself that he really needed Federer to have an off day to have a hope of winning that match, which Federer eventually did. It was incredibly humid at the US Open, one of the hot topics, <laughs> no pun intended, of a very dramatic fortnight was the heat and the humidity and the insane conditions that players were having to deal with. And also because of the way the main stadium has been revamped, the airflow wasn't as good and Federer was sweating buckets, which you don't usually see. So that kind of tells you something about how difficult the conditions were. Milman a lot more used to the humidity than Federer. I did think Federer's game had been up and down prior to that match. I thought that his flashiness during his matches disguised a bit the inconsistency and the lack of solidness in his game. But here's what I want to say on Roger Federer, because even though he hadn't been solid leading up to that fourth round, he had shown that he has as much talent now as he did back when he won his first Wimbledon title. He has the forehand, the backhand, the serve, the variation on the serve, the footwork, the movement. And before his match with Millman, people have been talking about how incredible he was, what a treat it was to watch Federer play, how effortless he made it look, all the things that we've heard said about Federer over so many years, which are completely justified. But it just shows the continued fickleness of people, because one match everyone is saying this, and the next match, oh no, is Federer on the brink of retirement again? What happens now? I think people are being a bit more careful this time around because Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal made people look really stupid when a lot of people wrote them off back when they were struggling in 2013 and 2015 and then 2016 for Federer as well and were telling them to hang up their rackets and boom, they came back to the top of the world rankings. Novak Djokovic now doing the same thing. People change their minds so quickly and 
talent doesn't die that quickly and I think that Federer still has all the tools, he still has all the ability, he doesn't look a day older than he did three years ago or six years ago for all those who were saying that he was done three years ago. And honestly, Federer's not doing too badly, he's not had bad results for his past few tournaments. The thing is that in comparison to his usual high standards, they're just not as lofty. But I think the problem here for Federer is the head game and the confidence and the mentality. While Djokovic has gone up in mental strength and confidence, I think Federer has gone in the opposite direction at the moment. I'm very much of the opinion that before his break at the end of 2016, the mentality was a big issue for Federer as well, because he was actually keeping things even when he was playing Djokovic on hard courts and at events outside of the Grand Slams. Over best of three sets, he was still pretty consistent. He was dueling with the best of the game and coming out on top on a fair amount of occasions. Then when he came to the Grand Slams, he was almost so desperate for 18 that at the latter stages of the tournaments especially, there was kind of a mental block and he wasn't able to play freely and play his best game and players like Novak Djokovic, who were feeling very comfortable and very confident, were able to take advantage of that. That long break left Federer coming back to tour in January 2017 with a sense that he had nothing to lose and everything to gain, he could go for that 18th Grand Slam title playing so freely and I think that he's just had a few iffy tournaments since Australia and it's been enough for him to kind of change a bit in his mentality and maybe not have the same confidence in his game. And his head just doesn't seem to be completely in the right place. After the match against Millman, he talks about a part of him almost being happy that the match was over at one point, which isn't the sign of a fiery competitor really. And then there was a lot of talk in his match against Millman of his inability to try different things and he was just continually serve and volleying, serve and volleying, almost mindlessly. So I don't know how he's going to resolve it. I think maybe he needs a couple of good tournaments back to back or maybe he needs a good runner to Grand Slam next year, which is more probable because I think he's probably going to struggle at the Australian Open in January given that he's not had his best form recently and that he's defending the title there. If he were to come up against Novak Djokovic at the ATP finals, for example, I think he would lose probably in the final even if he beat him in the group stage, which I think is what I said in 2015 and that actually happened. Federer beat Djokovic in the group stage and then Djokovic beat Federer in the final. The mentality showing through yet again because of the difference in occasions. So I don't think Federer will actually play much for the rest of the year, maybe two or three tournaments, and I think that he has chances but he just needs to get that mentality in the right place. So there we end it for today. What do you think the future will hold for these four players in particular? Do you agree with my assessments? Let me know in the comments section. Also I promised that when we hit 1000 subscribers, which we did a few weeks ago now, I would do another Q&A video. So if you have any questions for me, whether tennis related or non-tennis related, please leave them in the comments section and indicate that they are for the Q&A video. And if you don't want to leave a comment, then tweet at the tennis vlog and use the hashtag AskTTV. Thank you to all new subscribers and for all the views on the last video. If you haven't subscribed yet, do that now to make sure you don't miss any future videos. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.